Assalamu alaikum. Our topic today is varicell hemorrhage by Dr. Rihama Sawaf, Professor of Internal Medicine. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to identify the emergency cases related to bleeding varices and prioritize your management plan according to each patient. Then set a long-term management plan for the patient. Oesophageal and gastric varices, as you all know, develop with portal hypertension of whatever cause. Bleeding oesophageal or gastric varices is a serious medical condition that has to be early recognized and promptly treated because it is typically vigorous and often occurs in the setting of abnormal clotting, thrombocytopenia, and, peps and sepsis. How to diagnose? Of course, we should start with, as we all know, history taking and physical examination, the most important, you know, milestones in formulating a diagnosis. History taking and physical examination may raise the suspicion of a very serious source, source of bleeding, but in 30% of cirrhotics, there are other sources other than varicell bleeding, other sources of bleeding. The most reliable method to diagnose upper gastrointestinal bleeding is, of course, upper gastrointestinal endoscopy. But this shouldn't happen except after initial resuscitation. Upper gastrointestinal endoscopy should be performed as soon as is feasible. And as we said, it is the most reliable method or tool for diagnosis and treatment. Mind you, bleeding may occur, as we said, from gastric or esophageal varices or portal hypertensive gastropathy. In this picture, you can see a spurter at the nine o'clock and actively bleeding varix. How to manage? The most important, the most important, the most important is initial resuscitation of this patient. Initial resuscitation means that we have to protect the airway, position the patient on his side. We should have uh, an IV access with two large bore cannulae. We may even insert a central line if the peripheral access is difficult. We should take a blood sample for CBC and matching because we probably will need blood transfusion. Then we start intravenous fluids if the patient is hemodynamically compromised, initially giving half a liter to one liter of a colloid over one hour, then a crystalloid and continue until the compatible blood arrives. If there is massive hemorrhage, we even give O negative blood. If there are no signs of hemodynamic compromise, a slow infusion of 0.9% saline is put to keep the IV line patent because we can need it at any time. If the bleeding you know, continues, becomes more severe, the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable. We consider also a central line insertion and CVP monitoring if the initial Ruckel score is more than three. PPIs help to maintain the stability of any formed blood clot within the gastrointestinal tract as it reduces the gastrointestinal acidity. So we have to commence intravenous PPI, proton pump inhibitor, as omeprazole 80 mg by IV followed by 8 mg per hour, pre-endoscopy, and for 72 hours afterwards. We should monitor the pulse rate, the blood pressure, urine output, and CVP if it was inserted for all patients. This is very important. We want to make sure that the patient is hemodynamically stable all the time. And we have to keep the patient with nothing per mouth 
for the induction. Then we transfuse with blood fresh frozen plasma and platelets as necessary according to hematological parameters. We also give vitamin K 10 mg intravenously once only to exclude vitamin K deficiency. We should avoid overtransfusion as this may increase the risk of re-bleeding. What about antibiotics? Bacterial translocation, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and hepatic encephalopathy are serious and common complications. So early commencement of the proper antibiotics can effectively prevent these complications. We have to take blood, urine and acidic fluid cultures and microscopy at first before starting the broad spectrum antibiotics because several studies have shown that variceal bleeding is associated with sepsis. We commence a third generation cephalosporin or ciprofloxacin and continue it for five days. Terlipressin is an analog of vasopressin that is effective in controlling variceal bleeding by causing splanchnic vasoconstriction. 2 mg are given initially and then 1 to 2 mg every 4 to 6 hours for up to 72 hours, which is effective in controlling the variceal bleeding as we said. Serious side effects occur in 4% of the cases including cardiac ischemia, peripheral vasoconstriction, which may produce significant hypertension, skin and splanchnic ischemia. Blend band ligation of the esophageal varices is the most commonly used method and is safer than injection sclerotherapy of the varices. It should be repeated at two weekly intervals until obliteration of the varices occurs. This is a picture of band ligation of a varix. Here we can see how the band is here and here around the varix. Well, the definitive management of gastric varices is injection with cyanoacrylate glue. Endoscopic injection of such a sclerosant into the varices or, or paravariceal can control the bleeding uh, acutely. Side effects include retrosternal pain and fever, mucosal ulceration, late esophageal strictures because of the action of the sclerosant. Gastric varices should be injected with cyanoacrylate glue as we said. We uh, couldn't, you know, band ligate the gastric varices. What about balloon tamponade? Balloon tamponade has an important role in shocked patients and patients with hepatic encephalopathy, whom we cannot, you know, as we said, we can't perform upper gastrointestinal endoscopy uh, unless the patient is hemodynamically stable. So we resort to balloon tamponade. We use a sangstaken blackmore tube that is inserted with inflation of the gastric balloon only. This shouldn't be left in place for more than 12 hours in fear of ischemic ulceration that happens in its place. This is a picture of the balloon uh, of the sangstaken tube with its, you know, uh, port for esophageal balloon inflation, uh, gastric aspiration, and gastric balloon inflation. As you can see, gastric balloon inflation. And this is the gastric balloon. This is the gastric balloon, as you can see, inside the stomach. And then uh, a pulling pressure is uh, made so that <clears throat> this uh, balloon compresses the bleeding varices. What about liver failure regimen. All patients with bleeding esophageal and or gastric varices should receive anti-coma measures for fear or of liver decompensation to be precipitated by the attack of the esophageal bleeding. So we give lactulose 10 to 15 milliliters every eight hours per 
us or per mouth or by the nasogastric tube to prevent encephalopathy. In alcoholics, thiamine and multivitamins are given as necessary and we use enemas for patients who develop encephalopathy. Therefore, the management key points for patients with bleeding esophageal varices should be initial resuscitation with blood transfusion, fresh frozen plasma platelets as necessary, vitamin K, prophylactic antibiotics, third generation cephalosporin or ciprofloxus and echinolone for five days, third depressin by the, the following dose, band ligation and or sclerotherapy according to the site of the varix, varices, and if bleeding is not controlled, balloon tamponade is used to temporarily stabilize the patient so that more definitive treatment as tips can be instituted. Further management, TIPS transducular intrahepatic uh, portosystemic shunt is an effective method for controlling bleeding, but it is not available in all centers and may not be suitable for all patients. It uses a jugular or femoral approach where the hepatic veins are cannulated and an expandable stent is placed between the hepatic veins which have low pressure and the portal venous system with high pressure to decompress the portal pressure till it reaches below 12 millimeters mercury. Surgical management for such condition has been largely superseded by the tips. Emergency portocaval shunting is effective in controlling the bleed but has a high operative mortality, more than 50% and does not influence long-term survival. Few surgeons do it till now. A severe transaction is never used now. What about the prognosis? High risk factors include the following. Age above 60 years, shock, other chronic disease as cardiac, respiratory, or renal diseases, bleeding, diathesis, and the conscious level. The overall mortality is 30%, and this is highest in those with severe liver disease having child's grade C. Success rates for cessation of acute bleeding viruses by injection sclerotherapy or banding reaches 70 to 85%. Balloon tamponade may reach 80%, and thirdly, Preston 70 around are approximately 70%. Long-term management, as we said, we have to continue band ligation every two weeks until varicell obliteration occurs, propranolol, a beta blocker, is given aiming for a 30 to 40% reduction in resting heart rate. This reduces the rate of re-bleeding from varices and portal hypertensive therapy, uh, gastropathy. Mind you, this is not given at all during the acute attack. TIPS provides a more definitive cure and bleeding tends to recur only when the shunt blocks, but there is an increased incidence of chronic hepatic encephalopathy. Thank you.